Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Bill. I'm an alcoholic. Always say I'm uh, sober through the grace of God and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you look up the word grace, uh, it means unmerited gift, which means I didn't have to do anything good to get here. If I did, you'd have a different speaker. <laughs> uh, I think, I want to thank John for asking me. I'll let you know in about an hour. <laughs> uh, you know, I never know what I'm going to say. I don't... Uh, I don't have a can pitch, and I hope I never get one. I work out really hard. I got diabetes other than these other diseases and some more. I just found out I got a heart problem, and uh, he told me to keep doing what I'm doing. And, um, and then I ask God to show up. And not only do I ask him, I beg him. I ask him not let me be a phony. Please don't let me exaggerate nothing. Let me touch the one guy that I'm supposed to be here for. You know, I tell a story about a little kid walking on a beach. And he's at thousands and thousands of starfish. And he's picking up a starfish and he throws it in the ocean. Picks up another starfish and throws it in the ocean. Guy sees him doing it. He says, listen, kid, there's thousands and thousands of these things. You can't make a difference. He said it made a difference to that one. <laughs> and so that's what happened. You guys touched me and it made a difference to me. I got this... Uh, Loving God in my life that uh, keeps his arm around me. He's got a big white light around me, and he has to stay really close to me. He has to stay closer to me than he does most people in AA because I'm more screwed up than the rest of them. (laughs) When they go to these conferences, this is what it sounds like. This is not what the speakers say, but it's what it sounds like. It sounds like, you know, I got sober. I make $8 million a week. All of my kids are president of the world, and I make love four times a day. Well... (laughs) My life ain't like that. <laughs> I got a brother with leukemia. Let me tell you how I got here. Um, I um, had a lady who was supposed to come over. I got an old lab, yellow lab. He's uh, on the way out. He's uh, almost 13. And uh, she was supposed to come over and take care of my house and my dog. And uh, at 8 o'clock Thursday night, it's no call, no show. And I called the kennels, and they wouldn't take him. So I'm supposed to be at the airport at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I got nothing going on, and I thought, oh, my God. Three days before that, I have a daughter who lives in the street. She's 38 years old, and her name is Debbie. If you want to put her in your prayers, I'll appreciate that. Three days before that, she stayed at her mother's house. She sleeps in this little car. Thursday, I spent $600 fixing this car up so that she's got a place to sleep. And so I got on that little, she got a little answering thing, and I called it, and I said, uh, if you get this message within the next 20 minutes, please call me. I'm in trouble. And three minutes later, the phone rang, and it was her. And I said, are you drinking? She says, no. Are you straight? She said, yes. I said, you need to come over because I need somebody to take care of the place. And she come over, and she laid down, and she couldn't breathe. And uh, she's so sick, and I give her some money to go get some breathers. So when I left, she was gone, and uh, I hope she took care of the house. And somebody said, did you call? And I said, no, there's nothing I can do. That's God's job. That's not mine. So that's how I show up to you. And I show up, and the only thing I really do good in Alcoholics Anonymous is I do a lot of Alcoholics Anonymous. I still do uh, seven, eight meetings, nine meetings a week. I go to the prisons uh, second Friday of every month. I show up to Mojave Jail every Wednesday, 1.30. I go to the Skid Row Detox on Monday and Friday with my sponsor. I... Uh, as a Samaritan house, uh, next door where they house 43 guys, I'm there twice a week. I do a big book study when I'm in town on Sunday at the homeless vets in We house home 300 homeless vets. So what I do in Alcoholics Anonymous Good, if you're new here, I show up. And that's the only thing I've really done good in AA. Everything else I've goofed up. But I show up. And I figure if you throw enough at the wall, some of it will stick. So I just do a lot. The guys that do it good, they don't have to do as much. And if you don't do it good, just join my group. There's a whole bunch of us. We don't do it good. So we just do it a lot. I don't speak for Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't claim to. I don't claim to know a lot about this disease. But if I told you anything 
that I didn't believe in, then I would be feeding the purpose why I'm here. And there's a lot of speakers, especially a guy in, in Florida says, if you listen to me, you're doomed. And so I told my sponsor, and he said, just keep doing what you believe. I said, okay. I believe it's a threefold disease. You hear people say they're born in alcoholic homes and all that. I had absolutely no reason to drink. You could not have been raised better than me. I was raised by two loving parents in the deep south. I'd never seen them drink. I never heard them cuss. I never seen them smoke a cigarette. I was, I had to open the doors for everybody. I didn't care what color you was or who you were. If you were older than me, I had to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And if I didn't, I felt a little thing on the back of my pants. You know, I was raised right. I just turned left. You know. <laughs> I got, there's four boys in my family. My mother used to say, I got three sons and him, you know. And, you know. A friend of mine I love, he speaks all the time. He said he took a drink and he was like this and it went like this. And I always think, why don't you finish it? I had a couple of drinks when I was 15. I didn't go break down the wall. I didn't, my, the hair didn't send up on my head. I don't remember getting drunk. I joined the Navy to see the world and became a drunk. Somewhere along the line, I crossed the line, and I've never been able to get back across the line, and I didn't know that. I was, I'm not going to give you no long drunk log, but I was in the Navy. Uh, they come out in the 50s with a flu shot. It was an experimental thing, and they asked people to volunteer, and I did. And they give it to me, and uh, everybody on the flu had a flu epidemic, and... Uh, I was a radio operator. I started out working eight hours a day, and we was out at sea for 26 days. I was on a heavy cruiser. I wound up working 18, 20 hours a day. I was seaman of the month for the U.S. Navy. My daughter still has a big picture of me and all the write-up they put about me. They could have put my stripes on a hinge. (laughs) They went on and off. I went in with little white stripes, made, I uh, went up a second, second class petty officer and came out with little white stripes. And, and a lot of things you can do in the Navy. You just can't miss the boat. <laughs> I was in Japan and I was in one of them houses where they had the two things I like and I had too much of both, I guess, and I got up and the <laughs> boat was gone. They put me on an Air Force crash board. And, the day I got out of the Navy, I got locked up at Long Beach Police, which was nothing. I said, I need to get out of California. That's not a good place. And called my mom and dad. And I said, I'm on my way home. They live in St. Petersburg, Florida. But when I got out of the Navy, they handed me a whole bunch of money. And 56 days later, I showed up in St. Petersburg by the way of Chester, Illinois. And took the wrong way around. And I remember it was in Chester, Illinois. And they still have 51 Mercury somewhere sitting in Chester. Um, I called my dad and said, if you send me $56, I'll get a bus and come home. I'd run out of everything. I met her back there in Illinois, and we hooked up for two or three weeks. You know, true love. And I uh, showed up in Florida and went to work for General Electric. Uh, got a really good job. And uh, if you miss five days, or they fired you. I missed 28. They wouldn't fire me, so I just quit. I just, you know, I just, everywhere I was, I didn't, where I wanted to be, and I went to work on a commercial fishing boat, and I thought I'd found heaven. They was all drunks, and they fired me. (laughs) And I went and told my mom, I said, I'm going to go to, I think uh, a guy kept telling me, why don't you go to Las Vegas? They got 24-hour bars and a lot of showgirls. I said, boy, that's not a bad combination there, and uh, I went and told this little gray-head mom of mine that had a third-grade education, and... uh, you know, my dad's crippled. He's five foot one and a half. Let me tell you about my family. My father invented the first machine to separate the leaf from stem of tobacco for R.J. Reynolds for camels. And uh, they stole it from him. They told him he was going to do all these kind of things. And uh, he was superintendent of the uh, Brown Williams Tobacco Company. My three brothers, one of them still owns his own company. The other one made huge six figures for a company called Shipling. Uh, he was the youngest superintendent that... Minneapolis Suns and Welber have had. Uh, David put in the airports for the federal government, and at the age of 28, I'm walking up and down Fremont Street with everything I owned in the carnation box. We was all raised the very same way. They don't have alcoholism. 
I'm one of those people that believe that alcoholism is part of this is the way I believe. In the front of the book, it says we are hundred men who are hopeless of mind and body. And in the fourth step, it talks about that. It says not only am I spiritually sick, but I am mentally and physically ill, which means there's something wrong with my mind and something wrong with my body only when it becomes to alcohol. There's something different about me, Sammy, David, and Joe. If you watch them drink, you can tell it right away because they have one, one of them won't drink at all. The other two won't have two. My drink of choice is more. I don't know what yours is, but mine's more. And I didn't know that was part of alcoholism. And I joined the Navy. I got out of that Navy and went down there and uh, told my mom, I said, you know, uh, I remember my dad one time, uh, uh, my brothers used to get me out of jail. Uh, they got me out of jail one time in Madeira Beach. I, it wound up being another city. I had the wrong city for years, so them tapes, I don't say that no more. Uh, but I was trying to tell the truth. I thought it was. But they come and got me, and we drove about two blocks from the jail, and I made both of them get out of the car, and I told them if they didn't, I would told them what I'd do to them. And uh, I left them standing on the side of the road and drove off. I can tell you the next time I called, they didn't come. <laughs> and uh, I remember one time, uh, uh, my, my father used to say, listen, when you do this thing that you do, and nobody hears from you for two or three weeks, Will you please just pick up the phone and say, Mom, I'm okay, and hang up. Call Collect, because after two or three or four days, she starts, has anybody seen Billy? Does anybody know where Billy was? Is anybody? And I never knew what that was until, right, until I watched my daughter and Inga call me and says, uh, have you seen Debbie? Have you heard from Debbie? I think she's dead. I said, Inga, don't even go there. Well, have you heard from her? I said, no, I haven't, honey. Do you know where she's at? I said, no, I don't. Uh, Maybe she went to California. I said, I don't know, honey. She said, Billy, this is killing me. Now I know what my mother felt like. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is what alcoholism does, if you're new here, it destroys, it takes away the one relationship that you need, and that's a relationship with your kids. And I robbed my parents of that, you know, and... uh, I remember telling my daddy, and finally uh, they was going, have you seen Billy? And David finally said, if you're looking for him, he's in Tampa jail. And my dad was about this tall, wore a big old brace from here to here. He couldn't pick 10, down, 10 pounds up off the floor. And he got me out of jail when we come across Gandy Bridge. And he's telling me, you know, you need to do a little more fishing and a little less drinking. And I'm thinking, how in the world do you fish if you don't drink? Well, I found out after I sober, went to Alaska and everything, you do a lot better. A lot better so where you catch a lot more, and, the, and you usually tell the truth. They're this big instead of this big, you know. And uh, He brought me back in the house, and he pointed to the bedroom. I'm waiting for the lecture, and I never got it. I never told I was a bad kid. I was never put down. I was never told I was something wrong. But he said, that will always be your bedroom. Nobody will never be able to take that away from you, which is supposed to make me feel better, which made me feel worse. I'm thinking, why can't I be like them other boys? What the hell's the matter with me? I told my mom, I said, I'm going to Las Vegas. And she said, I'll help you pack. We don't know what to do for you. I'm thinking a couple hundred would help, you know. <laughs> Come across that hill, boy, in 1963, and I just said, man, this is it. And I uh, wound up living on the street. I had one phone number, and I called the guy, and he let me sleep on his couch for about a month, and he couldn't take no more of me, and he asked me to leave, and... Uh, Wound up walking up and down Fremont Street with everything owned in a carnation box. Uh, every now and then I'd get enough money to get a room. Got a job at the Las Vegas Club as a shield. And if you don't know what that is, that's the guy that starts the game one dollar an hour. And if I had forty dollars in my pocket when I'm walking up and down the street, you ask me how I'm doing. I told you it's not that bad. <laughs> Ain't that bad, dude. I'm okay. I don't want no company. I got money. I don't share. You know, if I'm broke, come here. I need to talk to you. And I never knew how bad that sound. It's not that bad, because I always say it's not that bad. It's not that bad. You know, I'm a little down right now, but it ain't that bad. My daughter come over to my house one day, and uh, she weighed about 80, 85 pounds. And one time she was a gorgeous girl, and she's still sort of pretty. And uh, But this stuff has beat her up now. And uh, she, she, I said, Debbie, I've never seen you look this bad. I said, uh she said, well, can I come in and take a shower? And I said, yes, but you're not allowed to stay here. She says, I know that. 
And she's not allowed to stay at her mom's now. We have a restraining order on her. And um, she came in, and I watched this kid take a shower, and I said, when's the last time you eat? And she says, uh, I don't remember. So I watched this kid eat about four times in five hours. And then she took a shower, and she came out, she looked like a ghost. I said, I've never seen you look quite this bad. She said, Dad, listen, I'm living in the back of a pickup, and we got a mattress in there now, and it's not that bad. I thought, oh, my God, that's right. She said, no, Dad, we're not sleeping on the... I said, oh, geez, if you're clean and sober, you could come in and sleep, sleep here, and it's a beautiful home. But it's not that bad. And I thought, wow, I used to say that all the time. It's not that bad, right? And uh, we were on the street, and I met this pretty lady, and... Uh, she told me to break a leg when I come here. We've been divorced 21 years. I don't let nothing happen to her. If you're new here, I still mow the yard, take care of her. I don't let nothing happen. I do the shopping. I don't ask for money. Uh, I do what my sponsor told me. He told me, give her everything when we got divorced and get on with my life. And so I did. And uh, when I uh, met this pretty lady, uh, I decided I was going to quit drinking, and I knew I could. I knew when I make up my mind to do something, I can do it. And uh, I don't know if they had detox centers or not, but I went to a hospital and the Sahara Hotel sent me to Santa Barbara. They said there was a guy down there that had good luck with people like me. I don't know what that meant. You know, another one more time, I'm different. And I went down there, and I remember him sitting on the side of my bed, and I don't remember how many days I was in the hospital, so I ain't going to tell you, but I remember him telling me this. If you drink anymore, you're going to die. You're not going to live very much longer. You'd be lucky if you make two years. I'm anywhere between 29 and 31. If, you know, I, Patty Ochoa is one of my favorite speakers. I just love her. And she said something one time that just blew me away. She said, if I knew my past was going to be that important when I, you know, I got sober, I'd paid more attention to it, you know. <laughs> but I didn't know it was going to be this important for me to remember everything that happened. So what I'm trying to tell you is I'm trying to give you the best thing of what I remember. I hope it's true, but this is the way I remember it. Now, if you ask other people, you'll get a different story than I'm giving you, but I'm just telling you what I remember, you know. And I, I met her, and I decided to uh, and come out of the hospital, and uh, I got drunk again, and uh, I got drunk and got married. You can do that in that town. And I did it more than once, you know, and uh, to the same girl. And uh, you never did that? Oh. I married the same one twice and lived with her a bunch of times, you know, and uh, oil and water don't mix, but we'll make it, you know, and uh, and I try my best to be a good husband. I came out of the hospital, and uh, this is what I want to tell you about alcoholism. Uh, I'm, I'm glad they wrote the book. On page 22, it says, uh, at the bottom of the page, it talks about the alcoholic, he, acts much react, he reacts much like other people for months and years. And let him take a drink. And the next day he's antisocial and just a monster. And the three stories in the book is what really helped me out. Because if you read about Jim, everybody wants to talk about he's irritable, restless, and all that because he's working for a company he used to own. But that's not the line I read. The line I read is right before he took the drink. And here's the line. Still no thought of drinking. The next story, 25 years, not only was he successful, he was happy. Took a drink in less than two months, he's in a hospital, in less than four years, he's dead. But my favorite is Fred. I love Fred on page 41. He's my man. Because <laughs> he's got traveling, he's got gasoline in his shoes like Billy. Just signed a contract, not only is he happy, but his partners are going to be happy. And all of a sudden, a thought might, a cocktail. And the next day, read, he meets a friendly cab driver in New York. I started drinking in Vegas, wind up at the funny farm in Phoenix. Don't ask me how I do that, but I do that. I, I get gasoline in my shoes when I get to drinking. I move around, you know. What I'm <laughs> and the thing about it is, the book tells you twice, and he puts it in a little scribbly writing so you'll read it. You will have no mental defense against the first drink. None. I will not get a warning. You know, I've been getting off of work. I'm a crab dealer. We get paid every day and getting ready to put the key in the car to go home to this lovely wife I have and my daughter. And somebody said, Billy, let's go to the plush horse and get a beer. I go, okay. Ten seconds before that, I'm not even thinking about drinking. I stayed sober six. Some people say six. Some say eight. So I say seven years. I'm not sure. But I stayed sober. During this period of time, I was employee of the month. 
for the Sahara Hotel. Good dealers in the back, bad dealers in the front. I'm on table one. Playing golf one morning, playing in a tournament. I'm in third place. I'm not a Tiger Woods, but I was crushing that golf ball, and I knew I was going to win that tournament. I'm playing with uh, the Mantle Boys, Mickey's two brothers. Both of them was in the gambling business, and another guy, and uh, one of them offered me a drink. And 20 seconds before he offered me a drink, I'm not even thinking about drinking. My mind, when I, right before I took that drink, my mind said, my mind didn't say, hold on, dude, let me talk to you for just a second here. Look how many times you've been in jail. Look how many times you're no call, no show. You lived on Fremont Street with everything you owned in a carnation box, walking up down Fremont Street, mad at people because they wouldn't put their cigarettes out because your shoes don't have no soles, and you're mad at everybody and you can't look them in the eye. This is what alcohol is going to do for you if you take a drink. My, the alcoholic mind will not give you the picture. It just will not do it. I have, and the book says, I remember a guy said, telling me, if you haven't had your dra- last drink, if you can't remember your last drunk, you haven't had it. I thought, wow, I don't remember my last drunk. I went and told my sponsor. That's the reason you need sponsors. I went and told him. He said, Billy, come here, let me show you in the book. It says we can't even remember the pain of a month ago, week ago, month ago. I said, oh, God, I'm glad I told you that, you know. Another time I went and told him. I got where I hated to go tell him because I was always wrong. You know what I mean? hate to tell my sponsor because he'd always correct me, you know. I'm in a meeting, I'm brand new, and I hear this guy say, we're not sick people trying to, we're not bad people trying to get good, we are sick people trying to get well. Well, I couldn't wait to go tell him that. I, went, I said, I'm not a bad person trying to get good, I'm just a sick person trying to get well. He said, let me tell you something, little jerk, if you don't get gooder, you ain't going to stay here. I said, well, well, you ain't telling him that no more, you know, and, you know, and I really believe that. The steps are designed to change my values. But anyway, I uh, started drinking, and uh, I was going to have a beer at the golf course. If you're new here or not so new, 14 months later, I'm still drinking. In less than two weeks, I was a falling down drunk. And now I knew I could quit because I just did it. And I spent the next 12, 13 months trying to quit, and I finally realized I couldn't quit. I was 40 years old. I'm standing in my front yard, and I started to try to do something that I never, ever dreamed I'd try to do. I started by taking my own life, and I'm not that type. I'll shoot you. But I started by taking my own life. A good friend of mine, he's no longer with us, and I loved him. He's one of my favorite speakers, Don Pitts out of Colorado. He said he was standing in his front yard, and I only use things that apply to my life. He said he had a mind that wouldn't work and a body that wouldn't die. He said, there's no place darker than that when you can't live and you can't die. And I thought, what if, and I, I'm the kind of guy that talks to myself. I ask myself questions, then I answer them, you know. I said, what if you have to feel like this every morning you live to be 70? I said, I don't think so. And I got this stupid thought that this little old gray-headed lady in Florida was going to think, I, would, I thought she's going to think she did something wrong. And I didn't take my own life. And in less than two weeks, I would be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and didn't even know it. I'm the kind of guy that would never, ever call Alcoholics Anonymous. My loving God knew that. So this pretty lady that I'm telling you about, she went and joined a thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. She ain't a bit more alcoholic than I'm this building. You know, I asked her later on, why did you do that? She said, I knew you loved me. I thought you'd follow me there. I said, I loved you a lot, but that's A and A. You can't drink. I ain't going there. I don't love you that much. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not A and A. 1975, uh, she'd sort of shut the drunk out of the bedroom, and that bothered me a lot. <laughs> so she told me, this is what I remember. She told me she was going to take me to a dance in 1975. And by the way, my sobriety date is uh, October the 18th. We think. 1975, and I uh, went to this roundup, and I took a shower, put some smelly stuff on. I figured if I danced with her a couple of times at this dance, old Billy might get in the bedroom. And I'm here to tell you that Alcoholics Anonymous worked, and I loved AA right from the start, you know. And you can, I don't know why you come here. I don't think it makes any difference how you get here if you fall through the roof. I don't care how God gets you here. If you're... 
alcoholic and you're sitting in the rooms of AA. There's nobody in the world as lucky as you are. You know, and so I went to this roundup and uh, the weird thing was I wasn't even listening. Here's the key. I can still tell you who the speakers were and what they said. It was Johnny Harris, was Father Hillary, Tom O'Sullivan, Nancy Stewart. I remember Father Hillary saying, we don't care why the mule got in the ditch. Let's just get him out. I thought, I punched this guy. God, what the hell does he mean by that? <laughs> so we don't care why you're alcoholic or how you become. Let's just do something about it. I said, well, if I was an alcoholic, I probably would. You know. <laughs> you know. And there was a guy there who knew me from the streets and a little Irishman, and I hated him. I hated him when he was on the streets. I hated him when I worked with him. He was a crap dealer. He was a nasty little Irishman from Boston. He's a Yankee anyway, so he's already got 14 marks against him, you know, and uh, followed me around all weekend, giving me coffee, telling me I could do this thing. And they told me he hadn't had a drink in a year and a half. And I thought, I said, you know, I just thought, I know you're lying because I know him. He can't go a day and a half, much less a year and a half. And I found that was true. Tommy hadn't had a drink in a year and a half, and that really amazed me. And I went all weekend, and this is what I hope happens this weekend. I hope, and it's been a great conference and a great speakers, and I hope one of us turns your light on. That's all I hope happens. I hope it might not be very bright, but I hope we turn it on. Just get it, just turn the pilot light on. Get it started. And I didn't even know you people did that for me. I didn't know that. I come home from work a couple nights later, and I walked in the house, and I told Inga, as soon as you fix supper, I don't even know where this comes from. I do today because it's a loving God of mine. I'm going to an AA meeting. i never seen her fix supper that fast in my life. <laughs> Eat. And the way I went to you people, and this is what I did. I raised my hand and said, my name is Bill. And I started going to two or three meetings a day, and uh, I didn't want to drink. I, I, I like not drinking. I liked that Inga was talking to me again. I liked that Debbie was coming over and we were sort of buddies again. And uh, Even the dog looked better. You know what I mean? Even that old boxer I had seemed to act better, you know. I didn't have a stick in my hand beating it, you know. And uh, I just started coming to you people and I raised my hand. And pretty soon you start staring, you know what I mean? Because you're supposed to say it. I'm a... Then one day I act like I was going to. My name is Bill... I ain't saying that crap. You know, and uh, right before the, my 30 days was up, I raised my hand. I'm a street kid. I raised my hand and said, my name is Bill and I'm an alcoholic. I could have I sh- could have said also, I'm a brain surgeon. I'm an architect. If that's what you want to hear is fine with me. I could cure less. Don't mean nothing to me. What happens is for guys like Billy, it takes a long time for this thing, a long, long time in my case, as you hear my story, for me to go from my head to my heart. But I had to start taking a set of actions that would change my life. And the first set of action was I got a really good meeting habit. They said, why don't you work the steps? I said, why don't you come on outside and I'll knock you off of these. <laughs> my favorite thing, I'm a street kid. If you've ever been in the street, you know what I'm talking about. Am I bothering you? Then leave me alone. You know, and some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. Am I bothering you? Then get out of my space because we're going to be talking, you know. And, uh, you know, and the guy says, you know, why don't you get a sponsor? And I said, yeah, come on, I'll sponsor you, you know, leave me alone. I sat in a room locked in a pissed off position, you know what I mean? <laughs> and no key, you know, and just showed up the meetings and uh, no sponsor, no steps, no recovery, like thousands of people just going through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous on the way to the graveyard. Got a year in. No steps, no sponsor. I don't know how many Z in the meetings I would go to. It to lo- on my days off, I'd just hang out at the Lorna Club all day long, and at night they'd tell me, we're closing, you got to go home. I said, okay. And I'd go. Come out of the Triangle Club one day, and I knew I was going to drink. Once again, this loving God in my life put the right person. As I come out of the club, I knew I wasn't going to get home. And I turned around, and there was an old guy named Ted Davis, and I'd heard he had a lot of Good luck with people like me. And I turned around and I said, Ted, will you please be my sponsor? And I hate rejection. So before he could say anything, I said, I'll do anything you tell me. And that's the wrong thing to tell Ted Davis. (laughs) He says, okay, be over at my house at 1.30 this afternoon. I said, I didn't mean today, Jesus, you know. He said, Billy, I said, okay, Ted, I'll be there, you know. And uh, 
I told him, I said, I need to work a four-step. He said, Billy, you just show up the meetings. You pick him up and take him over there. And he said, I, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go on the 12-step list. And I said, what's that? He says, you go pick up alcoholics and you bring them to meetings. I said, Ted, listen, I'm not a real alcoholic. I'm not what the book talks about. Jesus. He says, tell them that. They'll like that. And yeah, tell them that. <laughs> I said, Ted, you don't understand. I am so angry. I want to tear that face off. He says, God, tell them that. Boy, they're going to love you. <laughs> he says, here's what I want you to do. I said, what's that? He said, Billy, just be yourself. Let them see what you are. Don't try to be something you're not. You know, and 31 years later, trying to be Billy. Just be the best Billy I can. You might not like it, but I look in the mirror and I think he's all right. You know, I know he ain't no 10. I know that. But he might be a one and a half or two, and that's a better than a minus ten, I'll tell you that. So I just tried it, and I started doing that. And I started picking you jerks up, get in my car, in my old van, and you would start telling me, when I start drinking, I can't quit, and uh, I don't stop, I can't stop, and I know I'm alcoholic. I said, you know, I'm thinking, shut up, you know. Finally, I heard enough of you say that. Isn't that weird? That's all it says on page 44, top of the page. If you start to drink and you can't control it, and if you've ever really tried to quit and you can't quit, then you're dealing with the disease and it just give it to you that only a spiritual experience can conquer. And the steps of to me is designed to do one thing. Keep that drink pushed down far enough that I don't pick it up. It's always there for the alcoholic. It's not if I drink again, it's just when. And I've watched over the years so many people quit doing this process. And most of them don't go drink. Most of them commit suicide. Some of them drink and they can't get back, you know. And uh, Finally, one day I told him I'm trying to do the fourth and I can't do the fourth and uh, really didn't believe in God and I wouldn't pray. He told me to stick my shoes under the bed and do some kind of prayer. And I did. If there's anything out there anywhere, I need some help. There was a retreat in Las Vegas and... Uh, he told me he wanted me to go, and I said, okay, and it was Father Don Lynch, and uh, the whole weekend, and he just changed my whole life. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard the story about the lamplighter. There's a lamplighter in England, and at night he goes and lights these lamps, right, at night. And you can look back and see where the lamplighter's been. You can see every place he's been, every light he's lit in. But if you look ahead, it's dark, there's nothing there. And I can look back over my life and see everywhere where God has always put the right person in my life at the right time. It's amazing. At nine months sober, I walked into the beer bar. I'm on my way to an AA meeting to get a pack of cigarettes. I was still smoking. I walked in and, and I walked in and I ordered a drink. It was the only bartender who in Las Vegas who knew I wasn't drinking. And Billy looked at me and he said, Jesus Christ, Smitty, I thought you was off this crap. And I started shaking. I said, Bill, I'm on my way to an AA meeting. God, I want a pack of cigarettes. Oh, my God. You know, I go to the meeting, I tell this guy, and the guy says, there ain't nothing. I thought, maybe not to you, jerk. So I went and grabbed Jimmy, and I said, Jimmy, you won't believe I, I said, am I that fragile? He said, oh, yeah, you are. You've got an alcoholic mind. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, go ahead. He said, did you ever walk into the beer bar and, and order cigarettes first? He said, your mind was doing what it always did. As soon as it went in there, you might have ordered cigarettes, but not first. Give me a drink. And then you order something else. But you order. I said, Jesus. He said, isn't it a good thing that God was watching over you? And he sent you to the one bar, the one bartender who knew that you wouldn't drink him. I said, God didn't have nothing to do with it. It was Billy the bartender. He went, Jesus, <laughs> Billy. What if you'd have went to another bar? I said, I'm going outside. Right. The guy would have served me like I always did. Just not even knowing, ordering a drink. And uh, went to this retreat and come out and just the fourth step just flew on this paper. It was amazing. And uh, my sponsor said, uh, when are we going to do the fifth? And I kept saying, I'm not done with the fourth. This went on for over a year. <laughs> Finally, one day he said, when are we going to do the fourth? I said, fifth, I'm not done with it. He said, listen to me, go bring me what you got. I went home and got that crap. I had it hit because I didn't want her to see it. And I looked at that stuff and I never added another word to it. I just didn't want to tell another human being. I'm in the back of the Triangle Club and about halfway through this thing, it took like three and a half, four hours to do this, about halfway through this thing, and I looked at him and I told him, 
I can't believe that I'm telling you all this stuff. He said, don't you understand why? And I said, no, I don't. He said, Billy, you trust me. And I thought, that's right. I do trust you. And to this day, I trust Ted Davis. You know what I'm saying? And I couldn't believe it. I just went through it. And when we got all done, he said, I don't want you to go home, but I want you to go out because I was having marriage problems. I'd get ready to get divorced. He said, I want you to go out to the park, and I want you to go over everything we said. And he looked at me, and I don't know if he tells everybody that or not, but he said, this is one of the most thorough four steps I've ever seen. And I said, oh, my God. And it says in there, the better you do it, the better you can do the fifth, the better life you can have. And I tell you something, now, if you knew or not so knew, if I, you know, I've been did step works and I've had come, guys come and tell me secrets that they've never told their sponsor. I said, do yourself a favor, go tell your sponsor you'll have a relationship with your sponsor that you'll never dream of. And I've had them write me and tell me it came true that they'd go tell him. And uh, I would tell any, Ted anything. I could go tell Ted right now. I said, listen, Ted, I just found out I'm gay. He would go, okay, we'll just find some gay meetings. He wouldn't say, how the hell did that happen? You know, <laughs> he wouldn't put me down or nothing. You know, he'd just say, okay, we'll just find some meetings. You know, and I thought, he's always been like that. He never, uh, he told his wife one time, said, how would you like to have a pup out of him? She said, we'd have to drown it if we did. So I didn't. <laughs> And what happened when I went to the park, this is what happened. And if you're new here or not so new, and maybe you were in your first five years and you still got that big hole in your gut like I did. The steps are designed to do this. Each time I've done the step, what it's done is come make me a little closer to my creator. I come to believe and trust a little bit more in my creator. Not all the way, but just a little bit more. And there's a lot of difference between faith and trust. A lot of difference. You can have faith in something. And the way I describe it is, my sponsor did this for me. He said, because we had a circus act in Las Vegas. It's where a guy rolls a wheelbarrow across a cable in the circus circus. Rolled a wheelbarrow across this cable. And he said, if you watch him, you have faith he can do that. But if you trust him, you're getting a wheelbarrow. And there's a lot of difference standing there watching him do it and getting a wheelbarrow and thinking, wow, I hope he pushes this thing all the way across. And what I had to do was get in a wheelbarrow. And I've been in a wheelbarrow ever since. And, uh, and the closer I get to this loving creator, and each time what it does is it gets me there. Then when I wrote my character defects, and uh, it was one on there that really bothered me. And in step, and we the agnostics, if you read it sometime, I tell guys, take a pencil, and every time you, when you read we, the we to the agnostics, just put an X every time Bill talks about prejudices against religion, against colors. And I was prejudiced, and I didn't even know it. And I wouldn't be like that no more. So I started telling this loving God in mind, please help me with this thing. And one day Jerome called. Turned out to be the best friend I've ever had. When I got it in the fourth column, and I got over in there, and I wrote down that I was prejudiced, and he said to me, well, QB Bush is your friend. I said, yeah. He's always been my friend. Well, he said, he's black. I said, well, that's right. Jerome is your friend. I said, yeah. Well, he's black. Arthur's your friend. He's Spanish. I wasn't prejudiced. I just would put it on the race when something happened instead of and, and individuals, instead of judging people just the way they are. And, and I, I'd act like I was generous, and I wouldn't. So he told me one time when I was going through the second divorce, uh, and back in the one room, he told me to give everything to my wife. We had a beautiful home paid for it. She still lives in it. And a big pool, cut in jacuzzi, cut in barbecue. The whole backyard is cool decking. He said, give her everything and get on with your life. I said, I'm entitled to something. He said, yeah, your life. He said, Billy, I'm not worried about you, but I'm worried about her. I want to make sure she's okay. I drove by the house about a couple months later. And the yard was up, and it just looked like crap. And I went, yes. But I have a big mouth. <laughs> and I went over and told my sponsor. He says, how bad is it? I said, oh, boy. <laughs> he says, okay, this is what I want you to do. He said, this thing is killing you. He says, you're, this is one of the two or three times he told me, you're going to get drunk. And that gets my attention. Because let me tell you something. You'll never hear Billy Smith say from the podium that alcohol is not his problem. I hear people say that. I don't know. I, I'd go read the book. 
book says in step four, if we don't do the first step, we're going to drink. And if we drink, we're going to die. Boop, that sounds like a problem. I don't know. To me, it does. <laughs> then it says, remember, we deal with alcohol. It doesn't say I deal with my feelings. It says we deal with alcohol. Without help, it's too much for us. I do pretty good. I go to work. I'm a pretty nice guy if I don't drink. Let me tell you something. Ain't a soul in you wants to talk to me the day after I start drinking. So I'm going there, and I start to go over, and he says, I want you to knock on the door, and I want you to ask her if you can please mow that yard. I want you to fix that house up, and I don't want you to ask her for one dime. And I did that, and I've been doing that for over 20 years, and I mowed it Thursday before I come here. I make sure everything looks really pretty because it's her home. She's bedridden now, and she can't hardly get out of bed, and... I get her food, and I take care of it. She's got all these stray cats. I do everything for her. And uh, I was back in that one-bedroom apartment, and I'm telling him, my sponsor said, this, now this is what I want you to do. Since you're single now and you're going to have plenty of time, <laughs> I want you to go back down to Skid Row because you're good there. I was a GSR in Alcoholics Anonymous for two months, a year commitment. I did it for two months. One night they was arguing over $2.00. I wanted to take two dollars, break it up in little pieces, and put it where the sun don't shine on all them people. <laughs> so I went and told Ted, I said, I can't do that. He said, that's right. That's not your deal. That is not. We have different people for different jobs. Your job is back on Skid Row. Go back down there because you understand them people. And uh, that's when he told me about trust. I said, Jesus, Ted, if I go back down there, they need cigarettes and they need cheeseburgers, and I'm broke. He said, Billy, you don't trust in God. I said, Ted, that's not true. He said, Billy, you believe in him, but you don't trust him. Go help his kids, and he will always look after you. Let me tell you something. They started promoting me so fast that for me, I almost lost my job. Hey, isn't that weird? They could have said I'm fired, and I could have handled that. And they kept promoting me. I went in early. I went in 30 minutes, 45 minutes early every day. Whenever something come up, nobody wanted to do it, I'd raise my hand. They said, you're a kiss butt, and I said, no, I'm not. I like them big checks I get, you know. <laughs> I got a ninth grade education, you guys college, you know. You, you know, you can go get another job. This is it for Billy. You know, they made a special rule where I could be pit boss because of 25 years experience, and uh, I went in one day, I was still a floor man, a supervisor, and uh, they had a problem upstairs, and uh, somebody said, uh, God, you know, one of the pit bosses got sick, and uh, Somebody said, won't you call downstairs? Billy's probably here. And Danny, the boss, said, it's only a little after five. He, he don't come in till six. They said, well, he comes in really early. He don't come. Nobody comes in to work that early. And so won't you call and see? And I just turned the corner to come in the floor men's lounge. And the phone rang. And I picked it up. And I said, Smith. And he screamed, oh, my God, you already here? He said, get up here. We need you. And I got up there and... Uh, Went to work at uh, a little before six and a uh, quarter after ten they sent me home with full pay. And I can tell you the next promotion I got because my sponsor told me to go in and be of service at work. And I learned how to do that. When I left the Riviera, I was six and a half years sober. And the only reason I left there because it's the worst paying hotel in Las Vegas. And I got a $15,000 raise just walking into Caesars. They gave me a little piece of paper that I still have and all it says is, Good for rehire. I'd never had one. I'd never, le I'd never left a job that I could go back to. I gave the Sahara two weeks notice. They said, you can leave right now. We don't need no more of you. I thought, that's not very nice. I'm trying to be nice to you jerks, you know, and, uh, and over the time, it is just this process. And, and then I got all these guys in my life. And, uh, at 15, somewhere between 10 and 15 years sober, I turned the corner. I tried to get my family back in my life. I, uh, after I got sober, when I made my list, I had my ex-wife on top. Then I had my brothers and a lot of people. My list was long. And it's about relationship with other people. And, but then you have to look at my character defects. And when you get over into the fourth column, if you really look at the fourth column in the fourth step, I can see where I caused everything. I really can. It's just even with my ex-wife. I left her alone. And she started gambling and blowed everything I got. She figured she blowed my money. She, it says we step on people's toes and they retaliate. And she figured that would really make me mad, and it did. And to get even, you know. And uh, I got uh, my sponsor says, uh, "Thank God for my sponsor." He said, "I want you to give you half your vacation to your family here in 
Vegas, and I want you to give half of your vacation to your mother and your family in Florida. And I go call my brothers, and they say, Mom, say you're doing good. Click. So I went and told my sponsor. I said, you can say what you want to, but my brothers are assholes. He said, go home and look in the mirror. You'll see the one in that family. (laughs) So I did. There he stood. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to start writing them letters and cards. So, you guys from Montana, I'm a Vegas boy. We do it a little different. I started sending my nieces cards. Tell them from their Uncle Bill. And I started slipping $50 bills in my nieces cards. (laughs) And I became my niece's favorite uncle. And my nieces started talking about their Uncle Bill <laughs> in my brother's houses. We don't care what you think of Bill. We think he's okay. <laughs> and I went down there one time, and I called Bobby, and I said, I'm going to be in town for 11, 12 days. I'd really like to take you guys to dinner if you want. And he said, okay. And I'd like to tell you, it really turned out smooth, but it didn't. And over the years, when I was 10 years sober, my brother looked at me and said, we never told you how proud we were of you. I said, took you 10 years to tell me that? He said, Billy, you drink. That's what you always do. And I said, that's true. But maybe with this thing I'm doing, maybe I won't have to drink no more. 18 years sober, they all sat in my house and laughed and started talking about all the things I did to them and all the crap I did. I got tired of hearing it. I heard stuff I didn't even know I did. (laughs) And I'm sure I did, but I didn't know I did it. And I looked at them two wives and I said, "Uh, do you believe these guys? She said, no, darling, we love you. You're our man. We don't care what these two boys say. And both of them, both of them wives like Billy. At 18 years over and then at 25 years over, I got a letter from my brothers telling me I was the greatest brother anybody could have. Let me tell you about what happened on my 30th birthday. I have a brother, Bobby, that I love more than anything in the world. I have two more brothers. One of them's gone because of diabetes. And Sam, uh, he's my brother. Uh, he's Beethoven. I'm Phil Billy. He's a genius. I'm an idiot. Uh, but me and Bobby, we NASCAR nuts. And we on the same page, me and old Bob. We'd be friends if we wasn't brothers. Call me in the pit one time. I'm in the pit, and it's just huge, busy. And uh, they said, you're wanted on the phone. And uh, I'm a Earnhardt idiot. I got a whole room of this stuff. All my AA stuff and all my race car stuff, I drove, went out and drove that race car. I was the oldest guy out there and had the fastest lap. You know, I figured, where am I going? Might as well see what this thing will do. You know, I'm in the pit, and they said, you're wanted on the phone. I said, just take the message. I'm really busy. I can't take it right now. They said, it's your brother. And I thought, oh, my God, something happens. I said, give it to me. And he says, nothing's happened, but we got three tickets to the Daytona 500. We want to know if you can come. I said, hold on. My boss is right here. I said, buddy, listen, my brother just called. I got three tickets to the Daytona. We are going, right? He said, yeah, tell him you're coming. Isn't that weird? Earnhardt raced that thing 20 times, and that was the year he won it. I know it was just a coincidence. God didn't have nothing to do with it. (laughs) You can believe like that, but I don't. I think he watches Billy all the time. I think he said... You know, and uh, anyway, I just, uh, these brothers of mine, and uh, for my 30th birthday, uh, Bobby's got leukemia. Uh, he just sold a big home on the beach, big home, a lot of money. He's uh, sold it last week. He's uh, building a little home five minutes from the um, hospital. He only has one-fourth of a heart, so they can't do the bone marrow transplant. So every three or four weeks, they had to put blood in him and keep him alive. And uh, the company that he... Uh, Worked for, made sure that he would have enough insurance to pay for anything he needed for the rest of his life. And uh, he was going to come out moving with me, but he was afraid to cause of the doctors. And uh, he went to the doctor, and he kept going to the doctor. And the doctor, he says, as soon as you tell me, I'm going to go out and see my brother in Vegas. I want to go to Vegas again. And uh, he went to see his brother. He went to see his doctor, and the doctor says, I might let you go to Vegas. My brother says, is that a yes or a no? He said, what are you talking about? He said, if that's a yes, then we're leaving tomorrow. He said, you know something? Go ahead and go. Another coincidence. He got here on Saturday. My birthday was on Wednesday, on Tuesday. 
my 30th birthday. I don't do a lot of celebrating. A lot of guys, they celebrate the heck. I take one little bit of cake in my home group, and that's it. My sponsor come to me, and my brother came into town, and uh, we went and just do our thing and had a ball. And uh, my sponsor calls me up and says, I want you to speak at the high and dry group on Wednesday night. And I said, Roger, I just spoke there. I said, you know, I just spoke there two months ago. Get somebody else. He said, listen, I'm your sponsor. Ted was my sponsor for 27 years. He's 84 years old. He married a young girl, moved to Mexico. And I'm a... <laughs> God bless him. God bless him. I'm glad. Young girl. And uh, so I got Roger for a sponsor because he's 42 years sober and he's very active in AA. And he says, I want you to show up and do this, and it's not negotiable. He said, not only that, I want you to come early. And it's usually... Um, 40, 50 people there, 35, 40, 50. If, maybe if Bob or myself speak, there might be another 10 or 15 or 20 people. And I pulled in the parking lot about 6.30. So I asked my brother, I said, what are you and Faye going to do? He said, we're going to the frontier at Gillies, and we're going to line dance. I said, listen, this meeting's over at 8 o'clock. I ain't even shaking hands. I'll be there at 8.15, and we'll line dance. And I pulled up into this parking lot, and there's not a parking place nowhere at the U.S. Vets. I thought, oh, my God, something's going on here. And I walked in and opened the door, and there's like 250, 300 people inside this vet center, and they got perfect 30 all the way around this huge building. And there stood my brother and his wife, Donna, this lady that I sponsored, this cop that I sponsored, cooked up all this Italian food. And my brother said it was the greatest night of his life. He said, we knew you was love, but we had no idea you was left like that. See, that's what the people in Alcoholics Anonymous do. They do for things for us to make us whole. See, and when you do the 12 steps, it talks about this. It says, if you put this process in your life, you'll be happy, useful, and whole. I don't know about the happy part, but let me tell you what I need to feel. I need to feel useful, and I need to feel whole, you know. And thank God for sponsors and um and John uh, mentioned something that I always tell, and uh, I heard a guy, girl tell this story, and she told it wrong. I told her, that's my story. If you're going to tell it, tell it right. You know, and uh, it's about the man in the hole. I don't know if you ever heard it or not, but I got a Christmas card from Stan, a guy that I sponsor, and it had the man in the hole. And this is what Alcoholics and Models Me is about. It's not about this. It's about showing the next guy what to do. Don't listen to my mouth. Watch my feet. The man in the hole, and he's been in this hole for like, in my case, from the age of 15 to 40. I was 40 when I got here. 25 years. And a doctor walks by. And I yelled to the guy up there. I said, listen, sir, will you please help me? I've been in this hole for 25 years. Could you please help me? And the guy puts some, writes some prescriptions on a pad and throws it down into the hole. And he leaves. Pretty soon a priest come by, and I yell up to the priest, and I says, Sir, please help me. I've been in this hole for 25 years, and I can't get out. Will you please, please help me? And he writes some prayers on a piece of paper and drops them into the hole. Pretty soon my sponsor comes skipping along. I yell up to him, says, Sir, I've been in this hole for 25 years. Will you please help me? And my stupid sponsor jumps down in the hole. And I look at my stupid sponsor and I tell him, you know, you're the dumbest guy I've ever seen. Now we both stuck in this hole. My sponsor says, no, we're not. I've been in this hole before and I know the way out. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It's about me taking the next guy. And this is what I still do. I don't do I had a big book study at my house, but I quit doing that. I got one at the vets when we do that. But I take each new guy and I start him at the doctor's opinion. And I take him right through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, page by page. We do the third step on our prayer, and then when we get to the fourth, he has to start writing. And a lot of them you will lose when it comes a time to write the fourth. And the guy said, don't you get mad? I said, no, I just go grab another one. And I go grab another one. Because every now and then, you throw one in and you grab one. Not mouthing. If you read about Bill, the first six guys that he helped, none of them got sober. And he said, he told Lois, I'm not helping nobody. She said, Bill, you still sober. And that's when Bill realized nothing. When sure your sobriety is working with another alcoholic. 
My mother, I was 17 years sober when my mother died. They called me and told me she's not going to be here much longer, and everybody knew that she wasn't going to be, and I went down and spent the time with her. We all gathered, and uh, we talked to her, and she says, you know, I'm something I'm really, really proud of all my boys. And she said, Billy, I'm really, really proud of you. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous, my mother left this earth in peace because of people like you and this loving God I got in my life. This daughter of mine, uh, God's always watched over me. Uh, I'm a hunter and fisherman, so if you're an animal activist, cut this part out of the tape. Because <laughs> if it swims, I try to catch it, and if it runs, I shoot at it. <laughs> and I'll tell you something, there's a lot of things I can't do, but I'm telling you something. I got one rifle that don't stand out there 300 yards, because I'll hit you. And uh, October the 1st, they come and told me, they said, uh, I had these tags, and I'm ready to go, and Valerie called me up and said, Don't forget now, you got this workshop, sponsor workshop on uh, Saturday. I said, Not on October. I don't do nothing in October. I go hunting. She says, That's okay. We'll get somebody else. I said, No, if I made that commitment, I'll keep it. And uh, me and another guy did it, and it turned out really good, and I was so glad I did it. And I packed my truck, and... Uh, I was going to leave that night, and uh, Valerie come up and said, Don't forget now, tomorrow's Dick's 35th birthday, and they want you to be there because Dick really helped me. And I thought, Why can't he have his birthday some other time? You know. <laughs> so I showed up Sunday, and his birthday, and I said, All right, I'll leave soon as the meeting over. One of these idiots that I sponsor come up after the meeting and said he was really in trouble. And then he gave me the magic word, suicide. I talked to a guy one day until I was blue in the face, and he went home and did the job. So I take that very serious. And I said, all right, meet me in the morning, and uh, we'll spend some time together. And I spent the evening with him. Then we met him next morning. He was sicker than I thought. And this loving God of mine always has to do what he has to do to keep me where he needs to keep me. If I had had my way, that night, I so I finally went to bed about 5 o'clock, and I said, I'll get up and I'll get out of here. And at 10 o'clock at night, my phone rang, and it was my daughter. And she had fell, and the whole side of her face was caved in. And I said, did somebody beat you up? And I said, no. And she said, I need help. And I said, I know that. I said, yeah, I can't help you, but I know some people that can. And so I called Donna and them. They said, oh, Debbie called. And I said, yes. And they went and and they called me and said, we're not sure you want to see her. I said, listen, I've seen it before. It's my daughter, and she looked horrible. And uh, So they talked her into going to California, so we went down to the ABC Recovery Center down in Indigo, and uh, she drank and detox. And took her down there on Friday, and uh, see, if I'd have had my way, right, I'd have been gone on Saturday. If I'd have had my way, I'd have been gone on Sunday. If I'd have had my way, I'd have been gone on Monday. God says, i got to keep you here. Because we got a thing coming up, and you don't need to be here, you know. And you don't have to believe like that, but it's important that I believe that God's always watching over me and you. It's important for me to believe that. And that's what the steps are designed to do, hook me up with this power. And, uh, you know, in this 12 step, it talks about we can't, you know, and what's really made a difference in my life really is the 10th step. And I'd like to tell you I've been doing it for 30 years, but I'd be lying, so I ain't going to do that. But I have been doing it for almost six so we're 31. Don't get me wrong, I did a little spot inventory, but I actually do a 10th step every night. Did I exaggerate? I think I did exaggerate some things yesterday, and I'm sorry about that. I told God, please don't let me do it this morning. You know, you know, strike me dead or something, but don't let me do that. You know, I don't want to get up there and bull crap these people, you know. And, uh, but the 10th step, what it's done is it just makes me go to bed easy at night. And I see where I, and the next day I go, I go apologize, maybe, uh, I said something to a poker dealer, maybe I lost a big pot because I play in them pretty good limits, and maybe I said something I shouldn't have. Uh, usually when I apologize, I bring $5 chips. I said, here, I'm sorry. That always makes it a little better, you know, Vegas boy, green, you know. But then in the morning, I go to the third step prayer, the 11 step prayer. I do the third, the seventh, and eleventh. I don't turn no TV on in my home. I just think about my day. My phone, I, I tell them guys I sponsor don't call before nine unless you got if you're standing on a chair with a rope around your neck you still got two feet on the chair don't call 
If you got one foot off the chair, call. I'm your man. But I don't get up early. And by about 9 o'clock, my phone starts ringing, and then I go to a meeting. And uh, the 12 step says we can't be this... We can't be the good Samaritan every now and then. We be the good Samaritan every day. And so what I know where the homeless people live, and I know their name. I go ask them. I know one guy, he just hasn't had a bath and I don't know how long. And I go up and shake his hand. I always wash my hands after I shake it because he's so filthy. But, you know, I always and give him, I keep the most cheap cigarettes in my truck and I always give him a $5 bill and wish him have a best day. And, uh, I got these ladies I look for. I got these. I know where they live. I, I go look for them. You know, I got a game that I play. I did this thing. I did a conference in California, the S- Southern California conference. It's a huge conference. When I got done, I come home and I was going through my suit to get the cards out and the people stuff to give me. And there was a piece of paper in my suit, and I took it out. And this is the game. It's called the game, and I'll give it to you. If you help somebody, and you tell anybody. And you don't tell nobody, and they don't find out about it, you get two points. If you help somebody and you tell somebody, but they don't find out about it, you get one point. If you help someone and they find out about it, and you tell somebody, you get no points. And if you ever tell anybody how many points you got, you lose the game. The game is between me and God. The best compliment I've ever had in my life as I'm walking up the Samaritan house one night as I turned the corner to go into the Samaritan house. There was one of them homeless guys standing there. And this is all he said. There goes a guy with a lot of points. I thought, man, that's a nice compliment in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to tell you about this old lab I got. I'm going to close this thing down. I got this old yellow lab because I will not run over because I don't want you to use two CDs. And uh, I think about you guys too. And I hope you break even or make some money this weekend. And uh, probably won't sell many of these, but. <laughs> I got this old yellow lab, and he's field trained, and now he's coming to the end. But we always go out in the desert. I take him out where the quail and all that crap is. And was out there one day, and um, the wind was blowing really hard, and he got away from me. And it just killed me. I just found out he's got a bad heart. And uh, I got on this mound. I looked out across this desert. And there's no yellow lab nowhere. And I told myself he's probably had a heart attack and I'm not going to leave him out here for these stupid coyotes to eat up. And I'm not going to do that. And I got out. I started crying. I said, God, please help me find this stupid dog, you know. And uh, I need some help. And uh, less than a minute, here come a guy riding a bicycle right in the middle of the desert coming down a path. My God works quick. There he comes. I start screaming and yelling to the guy. And the guy finally says, What? What do you want? I said, listen, I don't want nothing. I said, but I got a yellow lamp somewhere out here in the desert, and I can't find him. Have you seen one? He says, no, but there's one in the parking lot with no tail sitting by a white truck. I said, holy mackerel, that's him. So I go running back, and there he sat. He's just sitting by the white truck. He doubled back. He lost me, and he's filled train. He went back and sitting by the truck. So I went and told his friend of mine, Craig, what happened? And Craig says, You got it all wrong. I said, no, I'm telling you exactly what happened. I'm not making up nothing. I said, I just asked God to help me. Here come a guy on a bicycle and told me back at the truck. He said, yeah, but you got the God thing mixed up. I said, what do you mean I got it mixed up? He said, this is really what happened. He said, buddy's back at the truck going, listen, God, I got this dumb redneck out in the desert. Will you please show him the way back to the truck? I said, okay, maybe that's what happened. Maybe God did that. Maybe buddy has got a better God. But whichever way, you can believe what you want to. But I believe God showed up in that desert. I always end my pitch the same way. And this is in honor of my father. I didn't get even with my dad my five years sober when my father died. And I'm still locked in a pissed off position. I'd just like to take him fishing one more time. He told me this story when I was real young. I don't know if he told the other boys that, but he told me. They have this horse race in North Carolina. Every year, kids 13 to 15, there's like 12, 15 horses in this race. And whoever wins this race is the king of the year. It's the biggest thing in this little old town. And all the fathers are standing in the winning circle except one father. He was back in the barn. And the guy in the barn said to him, why aren't you in the winning circle with all the rest of the fathers? And the man looked at the man in the barn. He says, listen. If my son wins this race, nah, he won't need me. But if he loses, 
I'm going to be here for him. I am so glad you were for here for me when I got here. So come join us to put this process in our life and watch all your family go stand in the winning circle. God bless you and thank you for having me. I'm really glad. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.